motion before the House this evening is this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. And I look to the first speaker, Mr Stuart Webber, to propose the motion. Thank you very much, Mr President. Ladies and gentlemen, may I warmly welcome you to the first debate at the Oxford Union this term, and indeed, this academic year. Whether this is the first debate you've attended or the 20th, it is brilliant to see so many faces in this chamber, and I do sincerely hope that you all enjoy tonight's debate. Before I move on to my argument, it falls on me to introduce the fantastic speakers we have for you on both sides of the house tonight. I'm certainly not the most experienced debater in the chamber, but what I lack in debating experience, I'm looking to make up in puns for you now. <laughs> the, the first speaker immediately to my right and speaking in proposition of the motion is Labour MP and Shadow Secretary for State, uh, of State for Communities and Local Government, Hilary Benn. A rare MP in that he has been praised for having one of the least expensive expenses bills in Westminster, he has held two cabinet positions and has spoken at the Oxford Union a number of times before. It's fair to say, ladies and gentlemen, that he's been there and done that. <laughs> They only get worse. <laughs> the, deba the debating strength of this side of the house increases with our next speaker, Chessie Whalen. A final year historian at Balliol, the honourable member is an avid debater and has represented Oxford as a judge at the European University's debating championships. When I asked people how they would describe the honourable member, the most frequent response I received was exceedingly well organised proving that at least one well-organised humanities student exists in Oxford. <laughs> she is bound to make sure that we have a whalen of a time this evening. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no applause for that one. On, <laughs> on the other side of the house, speaking first for the opposition, we are honoured to be hosting Conservative MP and former President of the Union, Alan Duncan. Having held a number of shadow cabinet positions over the last 15 years, the Honourable Member was most recently Minister of State for International Development and is sure to open this side of the debate with some slam Duncan points. <laughs> I, I told you they got worse. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Alok Sharma, Conservative MP for Reading West, who was elected in 2010. Mr Sharma has held a number of different jobs aside from being a politician, from working on a production line to tutoring university students, although I'm not sure what you did to deserve that. You know what they say, what goes around comes around, so it must have been some bad Sharma. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the final speaker for the opposition tonight is Nicky Morgan. Uh, looking expectedly. A graduate of St Hughes College and a qualified solicitor, the Honourable Member was previously Minister for Women and Equalities before the most recent Cabinet reshuffle. Uh, sorry, she is currently the Secretary of State for Education, a change that most people believe was made just in the nicky of time for the Conservative <laughs> Party's election hopes. All right, that's done, that's done. <laughs> Mr President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to look around this grand chamber. How lucky we are to have access to places like this, to the education that brings us to Oxford, to the welfare safety net we are provided by the university. However, there are many people who can only rely on their government. It is the duty of the government to improve the lives of its citizens. This government is simply not doing this. Think of the family forced out of their homes by the much maligned bedroom tax. Think of the 17-year-old put off from going to university by raised tuition fees. Think of the person in need of treatment on the NHS who has to wait for weeks to see a specialist and then whose treatment is put second to economic cuts. Think of the disabled worker whose minimum wage is under threat and that is from the welfare minister, Lord Freud. Looking back on the last four years, even though some good things have been passed, it is the manner in which they have been passed that is the issue. <coughs> the measure of a government is how strong, direct and effective is its leadership. I hope to convince everyone in this chamber this coalition government does not deserve to be invested with any confidence as it does not even have confidence in itself. Bearing this in mind, I must make it clear what I will not be talking about. I maintain that having no confidence in Her Majesty's government does not mean that you must have confidence in Her Majesty's opposition. Those of you in the audience... Thanks for that. Those of you... <laughs> 
Those of you in the audience who prefer Labour as an alternative can have confidence in the government, just as the staunch Conservatives and Liberal Democrats here tonight uh, can have no confidence in this coalition. Similarly, this is not a debate about whether the Conservatives or the Lib Dems will be able to form a better government at the next election. The opposition cannot win this debate by claiming that they are the lesser of two evils. The burden of proof is on the speakers to my left to convince you that this government, in isolation, is deserving of your, of your confidence by what they have done well and not by what Labour is doing badly. The motion before us tonight is about whether this current coalition government is doing a good job. I believe that the answer to this is no, and I will argue this with three main points. Point one, this government has never worked well together. Point two, the coalition partnership will only deteriorate before the general election. Point three, this lack, of unity, uh, this lack of unity affects each and every one of us as the deficit shows no signs of shrinking. To begin, I must ask you here tonight, if the politicians in power convince each other of the best, sorry, if the politicians in power cannot convince each other of the best policy with which to move forward, then how do they expect to convince us? The Conservatives and Liberal Democrats have consistently disagreed about policy issues. Earlier this year, Nick, as the Lib Dem website repeatedly refers to him, was annoyed at the inefficiency of the Home Office and Education Department that led to Michael Gove being sacked. It is widely reported that both party leaders are forced to step in to sort out ministerial disputes on a regular basis. The evidence of this is clear to see on the level of policy dispute. The Conservatives and the Lib Dems have fundamentally different stances on a number of issues. Take immigration. The Lib Dems on principle object to the Tories' hardline hard stance. Just last year, senior ministers from both parties uh, clashed over the government's advertising campaign that encouraged illegal immigrants to go home. The Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills, uh, Vince Cable, publicly denounced these advertisements as stupid and offensive. In fact, the Lib Dem Home Office Minister at the time, Jeremy Brown, was not even consulted about the campaign at all. There is a pattern of disagreement and argument inherent to the very functioning of this government and this stifles the State, the State Department's ability to govern. A report by the Home Office about immigration was meant to be released in December 2013, but was delayed for months, as Tory ministers criticised it for being too positive about the influence of EU immigrants. This delay was predictable, as neither side is going to happily compromise in their game of one-upmanship. This delay is representative of an internal struggle that prevents effective change. This delay is precisely why we should not have no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. There are similar issues with education, and again, there is a fundamental difference in the mandates of both parties. While the Conservatives have been pushing for a return to traditional O-level type qualifications and increasing the number of free schools, the Liberal Democrats are strongly opposed to both of these policies, insisting that every child in state education should be taught by fully qualified teachers. I look forward to seeing how the Education Secretary is able to manage these internal disputes in the coming months. We should not have confidence in this government unless they stop trying to beat each other and instead they're trying to beat the most serious issues facing this country, such as the NHS and education. However, we see the government making no attempt to fix these issues. Instead, they are moving further away from a resolution. This brings me on to my second point. Not only has this fundamental tension and inability to effectively make change undermined much of the government's work, but this divide in the leadership is only going to increase in the next eight months, leading up to the general election, of course. What's worse is that this is an active choice that both parties have made. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, and I must ask you here tonight, how can we have confidence in a government that is actively working to prevent itself from achieving anything for the sake of a potential electoral benefit further down the line? Thank you. Let me explain. <laughs> The policies of the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, as established in their, at their respective party conferences, shows a clear desire to distance themselves from each other. At last year's Lib Dem conference, Nick Clegg proudly stated that identity cards are among 15 Tory policies which his party had successfully blocked. This year, the rhetoric of the Deputy Prime Minister's party has only intensified as the divide in Westminster has become wider. The blurb on the party's website reads, the Conservatives can't be trusted to treat people fairly. If Liberal Democrats weren't in government, the Tories would focus attention on the best off, let employers fire staff without cause and allow schools to be run for profit. The Conservatives can't be trusted to treat people fairly. Is there a more damning statement that one can make about a government? I think not. 
We cannot have confidence in a government that does not have confidence in itself. While this might help the Lib Dems at the next election, it should not fill anyone with confidence for a partnership that must be successful, or at the very least workable, in order to achieve anything in the next eight months. Similarly, the Conservatives are not looking to build any bridges with their coalition partner. Instead, they view the Liberal Democrat indignation as a badge of honour, a sign that they are holding true to, con to Conservative principles and therefore will continue stubbornly refusing to compromise. Most obviously, is their different stances on Europe. Now, what was my final point? Oh yes, the deficit. How could anyone forget <laughs> such an important thing? How could anyone forget such an important thing as the deficit in a speech like this? I will outline this issue briefly. George Osborne and indeed this government as a whole have failed to cut the budget deficit by a significant amount. What makes it worse is they failed to meet their own target of reducing the deficit by £10 billion. In fact, if this government's borrowing trend continues, then there will have been no reduction in government borrowing at all. The only way that this deficit will be reduced as much as was promised is if the government works together quickly and efficiently. This is the slowest recovery in 100 years, a recovery sold to us by false promises, lies and deceit. Do you trust this government to put our interests above their own? I certainly do not. Thank you for showing the characteristics of respect that we all have <laughs> know is to be held with your party. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will finish with this. A government that is not only divided along party lines, but also made up of politicians who prefer getting one over each other than moving this country forward is bad. However, one that is purposefully sacrificing the short-term well-being of the UK and its citizens by widening the gap for potential electoral benefits is worse by far. It is because of this that the entire process of government is undermined. It is because of this that we should have no confidence in Her Majesty's government. If you walk out of the nose door tonight, you are validating a government that cares far more about itself, that cares far more about power than it does about you. By walking through the eyes door, you are sending a message that governments must work for the people. The governments must work for the school child who is convinced out of university by the fees and for the sick person waiting for care. Governments must work for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you can say that enough is enough. I beg you to propose. Thank you.